Hey guys, it's Brandon Lilly here with the Soren X B Legendary Podcast. On this edition of Pops Corner, we sit down with Richard Soren and Bert Soren to discuss the development, the creation, and really the inspiration for the base camp rack. We're going to cover a lot of ground today, so hope you enjoy. If you're not pushing the envelope, maybe in multiple directions, uh, I don't think you can do that for very long, but I think that you build a foundation and I think this is going to lead right into our, our talk today. You build a foundation on something that is so rock solid, so undeniable, and then you go out from there. And I think for, for a human being, that is your your moral compass. You know, what you define as right versus wrong. As a company, it is, you know, the direction that you want to go. And that brings us right into the base camp. You know, that rack really defines Sorenex. Do you agree? In many ways, I think it's a physical manifestation of what we're about. I mean, it's, yeah, is it a, one of our premier I guess, products, hardware, that that most of our clients purchase and just kind of in one of those pieces. But I think it, it's an essence of really who Sornex is, which is an innovative training solution over and above what was continued, what which was considered needed or possible at the time. It, it, it it solved a lot of issues that people were just good enough with those problems. I said, well, uh, we're, we're good with that. That's just how it is. And, uh, you know, in some ways, I, I it opened the door to a whole new way of looking at uh, looking at training solutions. I think I think people look for order and they look for progression in their lives or in lifting. And even the word base camp came to us because yeah, your word. not everyone is born just absolutely strong you have to start somewhere where you can look up at that that peak that 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 pinnacle and start solidly from a place you could push have something to push back against so that was the base camp idea and as you evolved the base camp will stay with you because you could change it and right. that's what it's made for that's kind of what I was getting at, you know, is as far as Sornex as a company, you have this standalone rack and, sure. it, and it, it looks like a rack is a rack is a rack. Right. I hear that all the time, sure. you know, online and when I talk to people. But I think as a company, our vision has always been at the forefront and our vision has always been to question, to change, to evolve. Sure. So just like you said, Having the a base camp rack with all the capabilities allows you to satisfy the needs of today, but also yeah. evolve and grow as you change. I mean, let's right. talk, you know, looking at a, at a standpoint of my career, I use my rack much differently today than I did even two or three years ago. Sure. And I know that in two or three years from now, I'll be able to evolve that as well. But for your average coach that doesn't necessarily have the forward thinking you know, he's just kind of in a system of this is my job, this is what I do. Right. Um, what What do you say to that person who just looks at this rack when you're trying to help facilitate the difference between our rack versus yeah. a competitor rack? What is What is the vision that you try to impart upon someone? What was your vision in the creation? I really think if you if you look at statistics, the better people, the stronger people, the ones that have taken that commitment never lift on cheap or shoddy equipment they right. don't right. they don't want to be injured they don't want to waste training time which is so valuable today um if you have quality in is quality out right you know and there's no shortcuts you can say oh well i could do this and i'm going to be strong no you're not you're going to you're going to pay your dues you're going to you're going to train as hard as you could go and you're going to evolve you're going to need to do things later and that rack's going to be there, right there with you. Mm -hmm. That's what you ideally should hope for. Right. And if if you want it cheap, well, what comes from cheap and right. shoddy? Right. It's not going to be a super strong man. Sure. Right. So when you're looking at this, and like I say, to go back to everyone who sees a rack as a rack as a rack, what was your idea or your original intention with evolving just a standard rack what what developed into the four-way hole system what well, first it, it, kind of working off of what pop said it, it, it he came up with the idea of the base camp rack because that's where the adventure starts sure and that's kind of the idea behind it, it because 
it's very easy to say a rack is a rack is a rack. Yes, it's a rack is something that holds a barbell a specific height off the ground. Right. That's basically what it does. But when you start realizing different attack angles and, and movement angles and different planes of movement and different positions and different storage positions and all of those things that go into it, if you're going to bench squat and ben- just bench and squat out of a rack, you may not need a base camp rack. Right. Much as if, if you're going to just carry your books to school, maybe a regular little Jansport backpack is going to work. But if you're going to hike or if you're going to go up Everest, you might want a, a modular system that allows you to it, to get into that solution of whatever comes your way uh, on that adventure, that strength adventure or that, that strenuous adventure. And so we really make strength gear for the strenuous adventure. And that's what the base camp really was was uh, built upon that idea that there's exercises or joint angles that you could that you could push and move in that aren't commonly available or they're there for a specific one piece that does one specific exercise in the gym now but how can we combine that like uh, let's say um, a hip thruster a banded hip thruster well we were doing that 12, 14 years ago out of out of the base camp rack where we were doing uh, lateral uh, horizontal bands into varied loads coming up from rack pulls. Well, you can't do that if you don't have the four place holes. And so there's just things that because of the holes, the holes give you options. And that was Pops' idea when he first started putting holes everywhere. I said, well, he put them in the safety bar first. This kind of goes into how it started. He put right. them in the safety bar and I said, well, why'd you do that? He goes, I don't know, but I know we'll use them at some point. <laughs> the, most, go, the most exciting wow. thing to me is to walk out in the gym and look at that rack and see the holes that were never used and know somehow, some way, one day, <laughs> we're going to have something yeah. that will accept, be accepted into those holes that are never u- used. Right. That's the future. That sure. is the future of training the what ifs, the unused hole. Or the undeveloped Superman that's walking around that never lifts. That's the exciting thing. Sure. It's not a gimme. Yeah, we could we could save money and put holes in specific spots. But what is that doing? It's limiting. Limits the adventure. Your, limits the adventure. Limits your training. Limits what you've invested in that you could add to. Sure. You know, it's it's yeah. to me, it's it's exciting to see the unused hole. So. Along the timeline of, of production and, and creation, where are we at time-wise, just so the listeners can understand, what, when did the idea come into play, and then when did it come into fruition? Officially, the base camp is 10 years old now. I think it was 2008, but we had racks with holes in earlier back at Gillespie's room in Liberty, 2005 or six, maybe? The four-sided holes, the first big job was at uh, Liberty University, mm-hmm. and Bill was, you know, a top-notch power, power lifter and just a brilliant mind. Sure. So it was, it's a hard sell when it never exists before. It's easier when people can copy <laughs> or easier when it's accepted. But to, to sell someone on the capabilities of something that has heretofore never existed, sure. with Bill, it wasn't that bad. He he got it. it and he it, had a he, lot of specific did. things he wanted to accomplish. That he, whether, that he couldn't do before, yes. now he could do. Right. And the base camp, or the pr- the predecessor of the base camp, which was kind of a, it was a whole four-hole design rack, was the platform that we realize that if we use this common language of these holes and every two two inches and all this other stuff that we could solve most of his needs and give him some more running room for that adventure because he's such a tinkerer and so are we and that's kind of going back to who buys from the base you know, who buys from Sornex generally the people who are tinkerers the explorers yeah. if if benching and squatting is your only thing you're going to do from the same height every day you might not be our our, our type of people because sure. The, but the ones that are going to come up with just like a Vernon Griffin right now, just right. So amazing things that he's coming up, or with. even Elmer. Elmer, absolutely. Is, Elmer's you know. crushing some stuff. So that's when you start. Those explorers are the ones that we really tie into from an, an emotional level, and they get it. And those are the ones that we feed off of. And we, I believe, that's who we're creating the tools for are those strength explorers. So you talk about having this this idea of, of something selling 
you know, to an unknown, right? Right. Was there a lot of pushback from the community? Was there a lot of pushback from competitors? Was there a lot of questions? I mean, sure. obviously, if, when you evolve something, you know, and, and I was just listening to a, a podcast talking about Tesla and the cars, sure. you know, and how people, there are still people who you can sit them down and show them every statistic, every scale of, of measure that you want to show and say, look, this is, if not at least equal, a superior concept yeah. that will move into the future people still will walk away from that and buy something else so what is how did you overcome that how much of it did you face was it is it just something that here it is and then immediately because sornex produced it no everybody they grabbed looked, on they looked at it you have to quantify each thing you you observe or, or you're afraid of it sure uh, a lot of people thought the manufacturers, well, it's overdone. It's too much work. We're going to lose money drilling extra holes. Why do it? They didn't understand. They could build things, but they didn't understand the principles of training and the applications and the future. Uh, it was, to say the least, difficult mm -hmm. to try to convert people to even look at it. Yeah, I we went for a um, a patent, and the patent attorney was the lifter of all things. And he walked in, and he looked at what we were trying to patent the base camp, and he looked at me like, "Are you that stupid that you're trying to patent a power rack?" And I pushed on. I said, "Well, you're here. I'm going to explain this to you." And sure. when he left, he said, "This is." He says, I want one. Right. Because it, at 20 feet away, it appeared to be one thing. Sure. But once he filled in the blanks or, or that, that was provided to him, he was, he was amazed. He saw the future. He saw the viability of patent, a patent on such a thing. How do you – we talked a little well, bit to about – to talk about the pushback. I mean, I, I guess I experienced probably the most of it because I was such active sales – very, 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 very few people got it. And, and I, I'm, we're talking base camp, but also base fit, which is basically the four-way hole design that we now call a rig. The, the strength industry calls a rig. Every company has one. Yeah. This was at the same time. So the rig and the base camp were literally launching at the same time. They used a similar technology, and which is uh, ex instead of having customized pieces welded to uh, a rack it was cut the first rack that was customizable by the customer that was the whole concept behind it you buy accessories it's a mr potato head it's an erector set whatever you want to call it you put it together however you want it people didn't get it they just didn't and very very few that just purely trusted us the bill gillespie's the nick garcia the craig fitzgerald uh luke richardson uh tom mislinski milo those were the guys that honestly they understood enough to go okay that's different i've only used racks that look like this from x y or z company but you're passionate enough about it that i'm going to try it and those were really the the forefathers of that whole movement because they they were great coaches that when given a new piece of technology they ran with it but oh we've heard uh, it looks too cheap because it has holes in it. Um, it's I, I don't like all the holes. It looks ugly. It uh, why would I have all this? I I already have a rack. I mean everything you could think of. Um, other companies laughing, literally laughing, going, "What are y'all doing over there?" Right. And we just kept pushing. You know, put five five years ahead. You know, half of the, our competitors started doing something like it ten years ahead. I would honestly say almost every one of our competitors is trying to do something like that along the same lines. Um, but I have to thank those first few coaches that maybe they didn't even fully understand the capacity, but they were the ones that believed us enough that I, I just kept telling them, no, it's, seriously, it's going to work. This is going to change the way you train. Do you think people are limited by their own needs? I mean, as far as when I'm when I talk to a lot of powerlifters, you know, sure. that's, that's my circle. That's my sure bread and butter a lot of times i get the same kind of stuff of they can't quantify what their need would be beyond squat bench and deadlift right of course i got a platform i got a basic rack okay that's fine i'm not going to argue mm -hmm. with you but you have a coach like you know a gillespie or a fitz yeah. who is looking at training 100 to 200 athletes a day sure. and now 
the the variability comes into play and it is almost mandated because what you're going to have a, an offensive lineman doing on one rack or one set of racks is going to be something totally different than your skill guys as well as yeah. going to be different than your swim team, going to be different than your sure. rifle team. I mean, I, I got to see this at UK. I got right. to see this in action. And the diversity of the rack setups, the I mean, there's there are definite overlap. <clears throat> but there is so much variability from one specific athlete need to another I think sometimes people get limited by what their view is and they can't think bigger they only know what they know and, right. and I had to finally I, I used to get me really emotionally almost angry I get just like how do you people not get this and then right. finally I just said you you only know what you've already been exposed to or you believe in I can't get mad at your dogmatic approach or your system or what you believe in I could only try to educate <laughs> And then hopefully we could go back and forth and brainstorm. And then from there, you know, we both had customers that, that have been integral in that whole uh, brainstorming. And, and now it's out enough that people get the concept that they're showing us things to do. Right. Hey, I, that, just, I took my that, utility pens and I did this. It's like, oh, great. Yeah. At that time, we were limited media-wise. Oh, yeah. And if, if I didn't talk about it or Bert didn't talk about it, no one knew about it. Right. Sure. Did that change the viability of that rack to what it is today? Why would it change the industry? Did all of a sudden they decide to go, oh, well, I'll go along with it? Or did they start to see where we were going from the start that direction? Yeah. And did it meet the needs that are today? Right. Perhaps uh, and our, our, our large area is the university sure. area in, in time and space. And changeover is sure. huge, and that addresses it directly. And that variation. gives you the, and yeah, and it gives you the chance to vary your program, change over for different groups, and do it quite efficiently. I mean, you're multiplying each save second times the entire room of people. Sure, yeah. I think flow is the the kind of the buzzword that yeah. we use a lot in these rooms, and understanding how you have a a minimum or a maximum amount of space and you're trying to fill it the most efficiently i don't think that there's any any question that the the base camp is it's pretty much mandated that if you're going to have a high level training facility you're going to have a four hole rack it's kind of like a smartphone if you're going to run a business you better have a smartphone sure if you still have a nextel you don't have the options right. i mean and that's where i see the holes in my mind are like apps on your phone a, you know, 12 years ago, a phone was a phone and you can maybe text on it. And then it became a GPS and a camera and a video camera and all these apps. And that's how I see the same thing with the holes. The holes are now a docking station for jammer arms. Well, now a jammer arm has a J squat. And now, you know, and you keep going, you could go down that road where if you didn't crack that Pandora's box open, you had a squat rack that held a bar this high off the ground. Yeah. You got under it and you squatted. Great. But... So what was the what was the first unveiling? Was it actually something that you put into circulation with a few select coaches and then took it to like a trade show or you know some of the conferences or did you show up at the conference and be like here we are look look, look what we got. The interesting thing that I just recalled that really pushed it along well coach Gillespie had the gift of a huge room, a huge yeah. space that was going to be built and it was his thinking that changing the program over during the year was very vital so it was programmed in 18,000 square feet and he was going to put a wall up and put equipment behind the wall in storage and mid-year roll all equipment in the weight room in the storage and take the new stuff out well, I said, why waste that space that you were given as a gift for, I mean, for a coach, it's wonderful. Yeah. And not have something that could stay there all year long, but change. Right. That really pushed and maybe sold to him the idea of uh, the base camp. And he didn't put up the wall. He didn't store equipment. He used the whole space and, and, and things like he didn't have the pain in his legs at the end of the day even after training more people because of the order of the room he didn't have his voice wasn't gone like it used to be in the old days because sc screaming back and forth everything was right there right in place 
set up for three people at each station and it evolved and when they were done with that they they you started using bands on the same rack as they used for squats a minute ago it it was it was the right time to do something on a big scale. And, right. you know, I, I think that helped push it along. Yeah, it, because the, the NCAA ruling of how long athletes had to stay could stay in the room. I mean, when you and I were in college, I know when I was in college as a thrower, we'd stay in there as long as we wanted and sure. just train. <laughs> but now it's, you know, 40 minutes or an hour three times a week, and so there's a compressed time. And so that's where the base camp and, and kind of where my guys are really focusing when we're designing rooms on the what we call the carrying capacity of the weight room. How many athletes could we get in there to move efficiently, safely, and effectively in a certain amount of time? Because that, that's all you're going to get. And so if we could have a carrying capacity of 85 athletes in a room, and that was really the, the room that really cracked that off was University of South Carolina with Craig Fitzgerald in 2008-ish, 8 or 9, um, where he had 24 base camp racks, 12 and 12, and offense would train on one side, defense on the other side, and you were up against the guy that basically you were playing against, and he was able to, to train an entire SEC team at the same time for Steve Spurrier. And that whole just the, the volume in the room of energy, of sound, of everything just cranked up. And and to this day, I mean, that was the that was the the, the golden era of Gamecock football. Now, now we had some amazing athletes, but the just the energy and everything, it, it somewhat changed how things were done in the college uh, football world. And, and there were so many variations and they were the f- probably the first to really utilize the base camp rack to its more full potential sure and that that put it on the map where people went whoa hold on what are they doing over there so i have a question i, I want to dig into your brain a little bit richard um i was watching pinocchio of all things you know Natural. and he's sitting here building these toys and these creations through candlelight you know and, and i kind of reflected upon edison i have a fascination with edison bulbs don't know why but i just see this tinker this this figure sure in in the night sitting by candlelight just sitting over drawings and going through your head what made you ask the question what made you ask the question of do we need this and then from do we need this to how do i build it and then how do i perfect it what was your process there I think that aha moment it, it might be sitting in a deer stand it might be over your desk it might be on an etch a sketch it, it could it doesn't it, the timing is different how you mm-hmm. absorb things i might walk out into the gym 10 times a day just to look at it to just see d- did i get a different view or a different feeling of what should be there that's not um I, th- I think having the in the trenches training and also a mechanical ability is the, the perfect storm coming together. It makes it quite easy to do that, to see it, to have seen people for 50 years lift. I go, gosh, he needs that. Or he sure. could do that better or safer. Or you see injuries occur and say, we could prevent that if... Right. Maybe it doesn't exist, but if that's what sparks, and then you start following the trail, then you get together as two people that are mm-hmm. potentially experts in the field, and it gets better. And then you bring in your, your trusted people, and they agree, or they they give you input, then all of a sudden it's you're on fire, you're going. Did you ever have any pushback on an idea that you just – we're so connected to something because I, I know that's happened with me before. Like I've defended something long past the point of I should stop defending this, you know, sure. all, all the time, all the time. <clears throat> but if you truly believe in your heart that this is right and it has value, maybe timing, which is the biggest thing, right, is not there. Maybe they just don't see it. They you can see the horizon, but not what's over it. Maybe they're that close, but you're already seeing over it. Right. So. It, very frustrating. I know it's going to work, but they don't care, or they don't know, or they don't want it. You got to you got to go where your heart tells you. So, did you go kind of Doctor Frankenstein on this and just start drilling holes in the existing racks, or did you develop something from? This we've we, we've cleaned up a lot of metal shavings out of the gym, man. My <laughs> lord, we've done a lot of drilling. I mean, 
yeah. we used to uh, you, you think back you know now we have lasers and this that and the other but we used to average when I, I started out I used to hand drill the holes seven holes a day yeah. you know going to where you could do a, a complete power rack in you know 60 something seconds sure it's but they the holes had to be there no matter how long it took it was something that I knew for the future would hold up people are going to use barbells they're going to use uh, plates and they're going to use power racks for many years to come but it's what you add to them and what you logically bring up at the right time is what's going to stick. But that, because they don't understand, doesn't mean you should walk away. And that's the, I, I agree 100%. I mean, to kind of answer a little bit of what you asked, Pops, I mean, there's been there's been metal yardsticks and, and uh, white paint pens and levels and just random i mean simple tools around our gym since i can remember there's been big spring scales there's been all this stuff and, and this stuff is everywhere and our our gym as you i mean you've been to our gym but our gym is also the r&d department that's also the muse that we walk through like he said and, and i think that's been one of the major benefits because at our old gym both of our offices face the gym and we had athletes training there all the time so I might be on the phone with a customer or pops would be and I'd watch a a female soccer player in there doing a a rear legged elevated Bulgarian and subconsciously I'm watching I'm going well it'd be way safer if she switched her foot unloaded and and I'm talking to the customer but I'm watching going okay I see how she stumbles every time she tries to find that if she could switch her foot unloaded that'd be faster she'd be able to go heavier more of an overload principle versus stability and oh great she needs to do that off a set of safety straps and then we were able to go out immediately switch something up hey try this come here hey try that and then we become a strength coach for a minute and we we get them spooled up and then we get to try it and that's something that i don't believe a lot of our competitors had that because they didn't also run a training center basically and they didn't they weren't training because you got to remember you know my dad's trained for his entire life and I've been at Sornex now for almost 20 years but 10 years of that I was a professional athlete so I had, training was the sport so it was always about what I'm, I'm undersized for, for a Highland get professional Highland Games athlete so I had to train smarter and more effectively of whatever happened so I'm not saying everything I did was right but I tried about everything. And so after a while, you just you, you happen on to some things that work for your body or whatever. So that was what it was always, you know, I, I would you know, you took a lot of lunch days at three thirty in the afternoon because Pops and I are laying on our back in the gym drilling holes because of something that's in the brain that you just got to get out. As I was sitting in a deer stand yesterday evening and and uh, just hammering away, taking notes on my phone of, of something that that. I dreamed up and by 8 30 this morning it's already going into the drawing in the shop because i fully believe in it but it's one of those things that i had to go home immediately i had wife was like hey what's going on hey hold on i got to get this out so it happens anytime but you got to get it out it's it's part of the art how selfish is the creation process of this you know obviously we're a company that, that provides and sells product but how much of it is just purely the desire to be the best athlete that you all could be because i know how many years now did you deadlift 500 in a row i slept through 49 okay so 49 years he was in constant pursuit of the 500 pound deadlift Mm -hmm. your constant pursuit of high level throwing um was this was this a genesis in selfishness and, and wanting to be the best that you could or did you always have the vision of if it helps me it helps others I think it's both. You uh, to come up with something that hasn't existed that helps people to be better, specifically in strength uh, sports. That that's your that's my PR. Right. That's yes. my high of setting a record. <clears throat> that it's as good as it gets for me. Sure. I mean, it's it's the coach's aha moment is the best part. Yes. Or the, the coach, the when customer they, when they get it. Yeah. That reinforces what you've fought and trained your mind to look for. Right. And you go, I'm right. Yes. That's the touchdown. That's yeah. the score. It isn't the check. It isn't any. It's 
you show something and they go, you watch their eyes and they light up. They go, I could do this, this, and this with it. And you're, that that's the touchdown. And the extra point is when they call you eight weeks later to go, dude, we've been using the so-and-so. I'm so glad we got it. And also we've done these two or three other things. When we can no longer do those, I don't want to do this anymore because then we're not relevant to the, to the industry that we love. Do you foresee a limitation on any kind of adaptation? You know, if a coach comes to you with an idea, can we make that happen? You have to you have to be careful with that because many coaches they they have needs, they have ideas, but they don't have a mechanical background. And they will come to you and say, if I want you to do it this way. And I'm thinking of specific times that that's happened in my life. You want to please your customer. You want to do the right thing. But when you see something that is asked for and you just accept it and do that, knowing that it's not going to serve them well, the potential of injury is there, you have to be able to say no or I will do it the way you want to but you have to sign your name to it right? that I am doing this in your behalf, not in my behalf. That's a hard thing to do, but the really good ones, they'll respect you for it. Yeah. There are some things that you have to walk away because it's just, it's, it's not ill-conceived. It's looking in the future. It's not going to work or serve them well. And you have to convince them of that on their terms. So when we put these racks in, what is our – I mean, obviously a lot of these coaches have been around now and, and the racks have been around for 10 years, so there's a high adaptability and understanding from a lot of these people. But what is our education point on these racks? When they go in, how much are we showing these coaches of like, this is literally you can do anything, and we show them, or do we just kind of let them run with it? I mean, how, how do we operate here? Generally, after after the install, we'll have a, a half or a couple hour in service immediately that evening after the install or the next morning where they'll bring their entire staff together, sometimes their AD, sometimes their athletic training staff, where everyone's on the same page and one of our, one of our people will take them, and that's from your day of doing that. Uh, and we'll take them through. Here's how you use these new tools. You know, you have this smartphone. Here's how you use the apps on it. Right. And, and that has to happen because – Usually people could come up with this stuff themselves, but they've invested in us to help them with the solution. There's the hardware solution is the actual rack, and there's the software is the application. You have to be able to, to help people do that. How much of that separates Sornex from our competition? I, I, first of all, I don't, I don't know how many other companies are actually producing equipment that has a, a very forward solutions orient to them that isn't extremely obvious right. say like a chest press well great you sit down and you press it i get it um our our stuff takes a little bit more um brains and application to use because it has that variability therein lies the art um i don't know what how other companies do that stage of it if, if it's a an internet if you buy it on the internet you're probably just left up to your own devices or maybe a youtube video right i guess i'm not really sure to be honest but you have, I think with us, you have a person there always, 24-7. Sorry. Somehow you could uh, you could contact us personally, and we could walk you through it. Sure. Or when we do, uh, as many times as a courtesy, when we do a, an install, we have not only people installing that are experts, we have people that are experts in the training. Right. And if they walk into a room and it's a particular shape, they might right then say, hey, coach, we have the drawing. Let's set it up this way where you could better use it for what you intend to use in your program. And then we'll show you why this is going to work better for you. So we have a lot of feet, a lot of boots on the ground that are technically balanced right. as well as mechanically. Sure. And part of the sales process is... I mean, it generally starts with, you know, what is your space? What is your budget? When do you have to have the room? But the next question is, how do you train your athletes? Is it a heavy powerlifting base? Is it an Olympic lifting base? Is it a functional? Is it more, more movement? Is there um, a mix of all of them? And, and then a lot of times I'll ask the coaches and my staff will ask the coaches, and this goes back again to Pops' uh, day, what he taught me was, 
would you please send me an in-season program, an, uh, uh, an out-of-season program? Let me look at what you're doing so I can understand is the equipment that you're asking for, is that just solving to the same level that you've always solved it or are there bottlenecks that we could remove in your room uh, in your facility where you could create a, an amazing experience for these athletes where you're, it's more accountable, more manageable, faster, a denser workout, where all of those things work. Do we have a, a, a solution for you that you don't even know exists? And that's where I think I don't know any other company that literally takes the, the, the coaches workouts and make sure that the um, that the tools are going to meet or exceed their current needs. So we're a solutions company. Yes, we're a solutions company. Or even on the front end, I would go uh, and actually see them train. Not say yep. a word, just sure. like a fly on the wall, and watch them presently what they do, the kind of people they have, their 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 intensity or their pace during a workout, looking for the bottlenecks before. I ever suggest what we could do to to help that, and then once we do install the new room, then go back out and show them right. how to use that. So it's almost like a three uh, a three step kind of thing. It is. I mean, probably my least favorite sale sounds stupid because from a, a typical salesperson and what they, you know, what probably put through will tell you if someone calls and says, "I want ten half racks," give me a quote. That's that's my least favorite. Because yeah. now I've had, I don't know what you're doing with them. Are you are you buying something that maybe there's a better solution for less money potentially? I don't know. And, and I guess that kind of takes away Sornex's ability to create a great solution. And some coaches, that's what they want. And, and other people argue me, go, dude, he just asked for that. Just quote him that and get the money and roll. Am I able to hopefully make that coach better? I don't know. I, I, I like to have my fingerprint on it a little bit just just so I know that they're in good hands. And, and sometimes it's absolutely. You exactly need 10 half racks. That's, that's what I would suggest, too. I prefer to have a dialogue. It it's costs more money. It's more overhead to do it. It's more time effort. Um, but I've generally found that the end result is better for everyone involved. Do you think that's why we have... <clears throat> Excuse me. We have such good buyback as far as, yes. you know, we see the repeat business over and over yes. and over. Yes. I, I think part of what we realize other than the, the paycheck for a job is the satisfaction of knowing we've kept two and three generations of coaches at sure. a particular school satisfied. That satisfaction to our company and to Bert and myself is just as much as getting paid. As long as we could keep a roof and the business going for our, our 100 plus uh, employees, that's good. But it's the satisfaction you get in your heart for knowing when you're watching a bowl game that you specifically were part of allowing them to be as good as they could be. Yeah, That's huge to me. It's driven me for the last 40 years. So who do you pick when you got two Thornex teams face to face? Boy, that's a good well, it's kind of nice. We, this weekend, <laughs> where we were watching one. watching football a little bit, and there were there was two NFL games that were pure Thornex teams, both sides, and we. <laughs> <laughs> where you watch the Super Bowl get them, boys. Yeah. and see, and yeah. they go, who are you pulling for? I go, my friends, who are they? Both teams. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You, know, you want them to do the best they can. Yeah. So overview of, of everything that we've talked about, the creation process, the, the innovation, the, the industry leadership, I, I have to ask this, is the base camp rack finished? <laughs> you could answer that. Never will be until every single hole is used more than once. <laughs> Voltaire says, once a philosopher, twice a pervert. So as long as they go back, right? That's right. <laughs> it, 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 if it's proved itself once, and it might take time to sure. prove that, I want to see the guy that comes up and says, also, you could do this. Right. That's, that's, and maybe not, especially from us, but that we've inspired a customer yeah. so much by the quality of a product that was unique for them to become creative too. Then they're part of the whole process. There's gifts that our, our customers give us to do better. Yes. It's their gear to go on their adventure, like I said. Yeah. I mean, will it ever be done? Absolutely not. No way. I mean, this week, 
in the last 10 days, we've come up with four or five new things that are patentable new things that work with the base camp rack. And the base camp's been around 10 years. I'll tell you what, I was just like when I saw the the J squat, <laughs> I mean, I didn't know it was coming. <laughs> I, when I saw that, I literally sat down and said, well, that's our nuclear weapon. You know what I mean? It's just one of those things that you look yeah. at and you're like, that just pushed the whole industry forward. It changed a lot of things. Yeah. Whether absolutely. people understand it or not, it changed. Maybe not as large as the base camp did or the jammer arm did or the landmine did. Well, those those all changed. But you know what? I, I, think, I think you're nailing the essence of the base camp, and I think this is a, a really good way to kind of conclude this is without the base camp, there is no J-Squat. Without the base camp, there is no jammer arm. Without the base camp... There are no attachments, safety straps. Uh, I mean, all this. There, there's no rig. There's no rig system in the in the CrossFit world that everyone has every rig. That that that's that was the the genesis of the whole thing. So that brings up a really good point right there. Those safety straps again. Sure. An industry first, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. So what was the what was the idea behind? That was 100 percent pops. I'm stepping <laughs> out of this one. That was a genius so. What was move. The, what was the deal? I mean, looking at it now. It's like, oh, it makes perfect sense. You have sure. the multi-layered, uh, you know, industry or uh, heavy-duty strap sure. type uh, material there, similar to a very, very thick seat belt, just if anybody yeah. doesn't know or hasn't seen them. Um, but you have those tie-downs kind of as a, as a mechanism there for the, for the strap. Um, against the grain of having this big, thick inch-and-a-half to two-inch diameter rod that you run through there that you go into every gym and you see them warped and bent and that weigh 50 pounds that way yeah exactly it it was one of the simplest but most difficult things to ever develop because there was nothing to follow uh it was a totally different concept going from hard steel to soft cloth right uh but you start thinking about it, and people were complaining about bent bars, fingers get nipped off when you miss the squat to the side, noise factor. And it always banged around in my head, you know, being aware of that, not to say, okay, I'll fix that. I was, it was an Easter Sunday, and before then, they, they had a program on about crucifixion, of all things. Mm-hmm. And I st- I'm always on the Discovery Channel or History Channel. And they were arguing if, in fact, someone could be crucified with a nail through their palm, not through their wrist. Well, they started doing these tests, and they found out that it matters the angle that the arms were set at. If they were nailed so tight and straight, the nail will pull out. But if their arms were slightly at an angle, then you could reduce it by one half of what the felt weight is. Right. So I said, wait a minute. I said, then instead of pulling a rack together and breaking the strap, it would actually pull downward. And an upright, we, we've tested them already, an upright on a base camp rack will hold 50 tons. <laughs> 50 tons. It'll bottom out 100,000 ton pounds. So. It, it, it will bottom out. So then I went... <laughs> Well, if I have a way to suspend this strap and be able to adjust it, I could have something that is safe, it's light. You could do two fingers and change our safeties. Right. Who could who could do that 50 pound or, or you're fighting to get a bar through holes? It was unplowed ground. It was something so weird, but I wanted to see if it would work. And there was three generations. Oh, easily. 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 Uh, uh, it wasn't like, bang, we got, we have it. It had, you had to tinker with it until it just was right, because there was no former uh, right. knowledge of, it's, do it this way. Well, we had to find out what was the right angle, what was the best way to adjust it. Is it better to bend it with uh, weld it or bend it? Is it better to insert a pin or have gravity work for you? All these things were like revolutionary, and we had to address each and every part of it. So from that simple program and a mind that keeps all these parameters of use that the coaches need and they wish for, people will put up with a lot. Yeah. And 
they'll keep doing the same thing over and over until someone says, I know you don't like that. I'm going to make it better for you. It's not going to be a life or death thing, but in the case of a safety strap, it really is. But I'm going to make it better for you. And that's how that strap took off. That's the base camp. In a nutshell, that's it's a strap, it's an attachment, it's a rack. It all comes from a curious mind yeah. of Richard yeah. Soren. Yeah, it was, it was I'm curious, yeah, curious, to say the least. <laughs> Crazy a little bit, but curious. 